What's up, Auto Orias? Welcome back to another video. Um, we're at the beach again this morning, and before I jump in for a swim, I wanted to start off this vlog because today we're going to be talking about sleep and how to improve it. And right now is one of the most important factors, and that is setting the circadian rhythm. Now, when a lot of people talk about sleep, they talk about nighttime routines, blue blocking classes, magnesium winding down before bed, doing some stretching, all of these sort of things, which we will get to later on. But one of the most important factors, as I said, is your circadian rhythm, your internal clock, because that is what ultimately sets a lot of your bodily processes throughout the day. And it's something that does adjust on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the most important things that you can do is entrainment, which is setting your circadian rhythm on a daily basis. The easiest way to do that is to get some bright, natural light first thing in the morning, about 20 minutes or so, kind of just make that the first thing you do. Um, I think the recommendations I've heard is within four hours of your minimum body temperature, which usually happens around 4, 5 a.m., is one of the best ways to improve your sleep later on in the day. Uh, I kind of forgot as well. For those of us who live in northern climates in winter when it's not sunny or it's not light cold kind of takes over the role of light when it comes to circadian rhythm so getting cold in the morning cold showers cold swims also a good thing <sighs> although i definitely say that watching a sunrise is more enjoyable than a cold swim or enjoyable in a different way choked on my coffee. Right, I just want to carry on very quickly about the circadian rhythm aspect because to be honest with you, I think it's probably the most important, certainly more important than some of the other things we're going to be talking about in terms of how much it dictates that sleep element um, because it dictates so much. And I didn't really understand all of this until kind of the last six months when I got much more in detail into things. I've learned about the circadian rhythm before this point, made videos on it, talked about it, but didn't appreciate its significance until recently. So as I said, the last six months is where I've been prioritizing just getting up first thing in the morning, ideally sunrise, getting outside first thing. But only a couple of times a week I'll go out to the beach. Most of the time I just go for a walk around the houses near me, get that natural light, and then be outside as much as possible during the day, and then avoid artificial lights later on in the day. And it's probably the first time ever in my life where I haven't had to get up using an alarm. Like I just, I, don't, I wake up every single day at like 6.45 at the moment. And then my energy during the day to go on top of that is just generally pretty good. So personally, it's been a game changer. I highly recommend just giving it a go and, and see how it impacts your life. I think as well, waking up first thing in the morning, most people, certainly myself included for the past few years, just would sit on your phone for like half an hour. Not a good way to spend your time. Much better just getting outside. Um, also for the mental health as much as anything probably should mention for those who are interested more in this circadian rhythm aspects is that you know that, that it goes very deep this rabbit hole um, I learned a lot from my good friend Ryan Carter aka Lefite who I've done very various videos on this channel I'll link him down below um, I would also recommend checking out Jack Cruz he's a little bit more Marmite you have a love and you hate him but very good on circadian rhythm stuff and then um, Dr. Hooperman as well who is also fantastic with the circadian rhythm stuff and he has a very very good way of explaining things he's just he, he articulates very well you can tell he's a lecturer professor uh, but those three people if you wanted to delve deeper into this i guarantee it is well worth your time and energy right it would also be remiss of me not to talk about my favorite thing more coffee <laughs> because this video is more about sleep than anything i'm not going to talk too much about coffee in the morning but it's a good thing when it comes to sleeping, caffeine has the opposite effect. It binds with those adenosine receptors and it stops your brain from feeling sleepy. So it kind of goes without saying that if you want to sleep well, you probably want to avoid shotting some Red Bulls before you go to sleep. Generally speaking, caffeine has a half-life of about six to eight hours in the human body. So kind of extrapolate back six to eight hours from when you're going to get to sleep. That's kind of the latest that I would leave it to drink caffeine. If you're going to sleep at 10, 
it's about 2 p.m. I personally stick to about 2 p.m. as the latest that I drink coffee in the day. Uh, but that being said, if you're somebody who is very sensitive to caffeine, not like myself, caffeine doesn't really do anything to me. It just, I just, I like coffee, it tastes good. But if you, you are one of those people who are very sensitive to caffeine, you might wanna even take that further back in the day or potentially have some fat with your coffee because that again can alter the absorption of the caffeine and slow it down slightly. My personal favorite is uh, dark chocolate. You know. 10 out of 10 combination. So, uh, next up, we've got, oh shit, that's what, uh, we've got training. This is kind of done. Doing this in terms of affecting sleep in chronological order throughout the day, kind of. So, training, actually much like coffee, stimulates a lot of these excitatory sort of awakening hormones like cortisol, and that means that if we train too close to bed, again, probably not gonna have a good time when it comes to sleeping. General recommendation, I would say, training sort of to finish no later than about three hours before bed. Now I understand this one, especially if you're working nine to five and you've got to work, train after work, might be a bit of a challenge. So do what you can. But if you can keep it away from before going to bed, it's ultimately gonna be much better. In fact, I actually like to give specifically exercise prescriptions in the morning to people where we're specifically focusing on improving circadian rhythm, having that one morning light exposure, but also some activity in the morning can really, again, help with that entrainment of circadian rhythm. So me personally though, I hate training in the morning. The morning is for drinking coffee and contemplating life. <sighs> I personally prefer to train about four or 5 p.m., currently about 5.30, but ultimately, as long as you get it in, that's the main point. So next up on the list, number four, we have uh, we have food. The thing that comes after training, the thing that we look forward to, the highlight of my day right now. Uh, this one, this one is uh, arguably pretty, pretty meaty. So I haven't got too much to say food because in general, it's not a massive concern, but I would just mention that you don't want to eat too late to bed. Now, this one I am very guilty of myself because usually I just get wrapped up with training, finishing off some other bits and pieces, and just generally kind of forget the time. For example, it's currently 20 past eight, which is gonna break the rule that I'm just about to give you, which is generally speaking, you don't wanna have a big meal earlier than three hours before bed. I think the rule is like three, two, one, don't eat three hours before bed, stop working two hours before bed, and then try to not be on your technology or phone one hour before bed. So I'm breaking this rule, I'm gonna to go to bed in like two hours and I do know that this doesn't help my sleep because I can track it with this one, but not everything can be optimal. Whilst we're here, also just a, a side point, this is very anecdotal, but I've noticed through the data on my aura ring that when I have a big meat serving in the evening, a high protein meal, I tend to find that I get subsequently a higher deep sleep afterwards. That's just the correlation that I've noticed. I have no evidence to back this up. As I said, it's just anecdotal, but I thought it was kind of interesting. One of the other things that gets brought up is, uh, is supplements. So that's uh, point number five on the list. Now, when it comes to supplements, I try to avoid taking them where possible. It's why the first four points on this list are really all about what are the natural things that we can do to improve sleep. A lot of it comes down to that circadian rhythm, but you know, there are some supplements that I would consider useful. The first being these funky glasses or uh, these even funkier ones. So this is the comment that I probably get the most on videos when I do vlogs. So I finish a day and I'm wearing my Elton John glasses and a lot of people ask why, and these are blue blockers, if you know what they are. 
they block the blue and also green spectrum of light which is more associated with daytime. So these lights right now, I don't usually have bright lights on in the evening but I'm filming and you wouldn't be able to see me. But these are communicating right now to your body, that circadian rhythm we talked about earlier, that it's midday. It's definitely not midday, it's definitely like 8 o'clock at night. So these things can help with that. They can also help reduce some of that blue light from artificial screens if you're watching TV at night, which is not the best thing, but again, I do it, it's not the end of the world. I would consider these a supplement because they kind of fit the same category. So next on the supplement list is magnesium. Now, a lot of times you'll see magnesium that is taken in the form of usually a pill. Whereas what I've been doing probably for the last year is thanks again to my mate, Brian, who I mentioned earlier, Levite, is this like natural form of magnesium because form kind of matters when you're taking certain supplements. So this is magnesium hydroxide, which is from like a marine source, the sea. And then when you mix it with carbon dioxide that is in sparkling water, you get magnesium bicarbonate, which is the natural source that you would find in water. So supposedly it gets absorbed better. And I kind of like it. Basically one of these, you pour a little bit out to begin with, but that will do like three nights of magnesium, basically. If you want to avoid plastic waste, you can always use like one of these, a soda stream to make your own sparkling water with CO2. Um, this is a little bit extra to be honest. Capsule still does the same thing, but I just, I just like this one. I'll link to his recipe for it down below. Magnesium is important because it's just a fundamental mineral. It's involved in over 300 enzymatic processes in the body, fundamental for lots of stuff. Specifically to do with sleep, it's a precursor to melatonin. The other thing that is important is vitamin D. It's also a precursor, it's worth taking, especially when it comes to mitigation of COVID risk as well. If we're kind of following the point that I mentioned earlier about getting outside, getting in the sunlight, really vitamin D requirements are probably gonna be checked off. You're outside a lot, especially with large amounts of skin exposed. If not, taking an oral supplement, also absolutely fine. So that's, that's for me, that's kind of supplements. Right, it is the morning after, so I thought I would touch on the final aspect of sleep related stuff, and that is tracking or assessing, because if you're not assessing, then you're just gonna be guessing. For this, I'm gonna be using my Aura Ring, which I talked about in various videos. One of my favorite variables, just simply because of the form factor, like it's, it's real minimal, uh, but obviously if you've got a Fitbit, if you've got an Apple Watch, these do many of the same things as well. But if you want some good sleep tracking, you're gonna need a wearable to get some reliable data. I'll just link to my uh, my video on the Aura Ring down below if you, wanna, if you wanna look into that one a little bit more. I feel like I could do an entire video in and of itself on how I use the sleep data in the Aura Ring. If you do wanna see that, then I'd happily chat through it. I might even get some guests on who know more than me about this sort of stuff, that'd be kind of interesting. But for the moment, there's a few key things that I like to look at the next day. Uh, number one, I just like to look at my sleep quality. So how I would assess sleep quality is just looking at the amount of deep sleep and REM that I get during the night. So ideally, I think the recommendation is around 20% or more when it comes to deep sleep, probably the same for REM as well. Deep is when we are getting that physical restoration. It's gonna be important if you're training a lot. I do find that if I train hard and I'm doing a lot of training, my deep sleep goes massively up in comparison to my REM. REM is more about that mental restoration. So again, important to cogs, function and memories, that sort of thing. Uh, last night, I got two hours, 41 minutes, or 40% of my sleep time was deep sleep. That's kind of high for me, I would say. Usually it's around the 30%, and I got one hour of REM, which again is on the lower side, but I always usually end up with a little bit lower REM anyway. I don't know if that's a personal thing, but that's just what I've noticed. Alongside this, I also kind of like to look at just the general trend of sleeping. Was I awake a lot in the night? Sometimes you don't really realize it when you're sleeping. Or do I have that kind of usual S-shaped curve, which you're looking for in sleep, where you get that shift into deep sleep initially, and then it transitions to lighter sleep as you get towards that waking time, which is kind of what's shown here. The next thing I like to look at is my heart rate, heart rate variability. So heart rate variability is kind of an assessment of your recovery. It's looking at the differences between your central nervous system tone, and it kind of takes that measurement and kind of higher the number, the better, but it actually is quite individual as well. Me personally, I kind of hover around the 60 milliseconds for my average mark. So I know that if I'm around that, then I'm probably pretty recovered. If I'm more than that, I'm doing pretty well. Less, maybe I need to take a day off or rest or recover. If you're ill, for example, then I will take a day off. I also like to look at heart rate. If you look at this 
graph you'll see that the heart rate starts quite high which is probably going to be due to the fact that I ate late and a large meal last night that's where I see that increase in heart rate for my average heart rate um, again it's actually a really good metric if you're going to measure one thing if you don't have any wearables or any of this sort of fancy stuff measuring your heart rate is one of the best ways to assess your recovery right so that is uh, kind of my six steps my six points when it comes to improving sleep quality there's one thing that i missed out on and that is some some pre-bedtime sort of things but to be honest i actually haven't found that it makes a massive impact on my sleep i found that if i get the things that i mentioned earlier more about circadian rhythm paying attention to caffeine intake paying attention to when i'm eating and you know winding down before bed reducing the lights then that's really the core things. Some additional ones might be uh, doing some general stretching. I tend to do like 15, 20 minutes of relaxed stretching kind of within the half an hour before I go to bed just to kind of chill out. You could do some breathing, you could do some reading, you could do lots of things. It's really completely up to you, but I would just have you know a short period of time where you have a little bit of a mental break from the day to properly unwind before bed. Uh, that being said, if you had any tips that maybe I didn't mention in this video, there's probably plenty of them out there, then why not share that with everyone else who is watching this video? So leave a comment in the comment section down below. If you just enjoyed this video, found it useful, hit that thumbs up button and support the channel. Right next to it is that subscribe button if you want to join the Bodyweight Warrior Tribe. But that has basically been it for this week, guys. I'll catch you in the next episode. Have a strong week.